In this video, I'd like to start our conversation about campaign communication and messaging by discussing broadly just this idea and the relationship between politics and the press. So we may think that this sort of uneasy relationship has started with you know, more current presidents, you know, such as Donald Trump uh, accusing or, or telling established, respected White House reporter Peter Alexander that he's a terrible reporter and, and really, I mean, just you know, chastising him for not knowing what he's doing just because he didn't like what he's hearing. We may think that the contentious relationship between the public and the, I'm sorry, the press and the president started, you know, with these more recent examples. Uh, but the truth is, the, the uneasy relationship between politics and the press goes all the way back even to our, our first president, George Washington, who had to endure some sort of uh, scathing articles and things in newspapers, but weathered them fairly well. He was pretty stoic about the way um, that he did that. He may have complained privately, but he, you know, publicly was pretty stoic about the whole thing. But, you know, we don't have to go very, we don't have to fast forward very far to get to 1798 and full disclosure, one of my favorite presidents, John Adams, though, who made a, a, a horrible, terrible mistake in passing the, what were then called the Alien and Sedition Acts, which were two separate things, but really uh, passed together. So the Sedition Act is the one we're concerned with. 1798 passed the Sedition Act, which basically made it illegal to, to say anything harsh about the government or you know, to claim anything false. But, but really, they expanded the definition to say you can't speak poorly of the presidency or the government in general, which clearly violates the First Amendment, which had already been passed at that point. So um, it didn't last long, but, you know, it was passed in 1798 um, and but and repealed in 1801. And and, and uh, Thomas Jefferson then pardoned anybody who had ever been, uh, you know, uh, arrested for or accused of sedition under that act. But um, so for, for all his good qualities, John Adams was pretty thin skinned. So it probably didn't take much for him to get behind the Sedition Act, and uh, and I know he regretted it later. He wrote about regretting it later, but still, you know, that was, he had a very, as the second president of the United States, had a very contentious relationship with the press and a very adversarial relationship with the press. So th this has always kind of been a thing, and that's just U.S. history. We go all the way back into, you know, any recorded history, and you're going to find uh, some of that tension between the press and and. Uh, and politics, which is really their purpose, though. Sometimes the press is referred to as the fourth branch of the government. I mean, that their job really is to kind of keep people like that in check. But so kind of getting ahead of myself. But this has always been there. There's always been a thing between the politics and the press. So uh, it's something that we need to be aware of. So the role of the press in politics in particular, though, is something that we need to examine and really understand if we're going to understand this relationship. Press and the politics, they're not, they're not there to be their friends. The, the press is not there to be the friends of politicians. They're also not there to be our friends as, as the audience. So we need to keep that in mind as well. They have their own uh, role, their own purpose in this whole, uh, this whole uh, setup. So, um, so the role of the press in politics, first of all, is to advocate for the truth. That's the role of any journalist, really, it should be to advocate for the truth. It should be number one in their mind, um, to, to push the truth, to find the truth, to, to reveal the truth, and to, uh, to express the truth to their audience. So the role of the press, number one, is to advocate for the truth. Uh, secondly, they're, they're sort of an independent monitor of power. As I said, they're sometimes called the fourth branch of the government. Um, so, you know, the U.S. government is set up on a system of checks and balances where each of the, the branches was designed to kind of be a check on and a balance on the other uh, branches. And the, the press is sort of seen as the fourth branch of that, which is why they're established. Uh, freedom of the press and freedom of speech are established really as much as anything in the First Amendment because they are so significant to the uh, to the um, to the maintenance of this democracy in terms of being an independent monitor of power, revealing things like over over the years, but more con contemporary things like uh, revealing things like Watergate, revealing things like the Iran Contra scandal, revealing things even like even like the Monica Lewinsky scandal, which was you know more scandal than, than whatever, but it still you know had to do with the president, had to do with the, the, a question of character and trustworthiness and things. So um, so the press is there to really be an independent monitor. Of power, that's that's one of their significant roles. They're also a voice for the voiceless, voice to the voiceless. They give voice to the voiceless, um, and things that people might not otherwise be heard. The press is there to kind of give them that megaphone, to give them that pulpit to to speak from, and and to provide them a voice in circles that they might not otherwise, in which they might not otherwise have been heard. 
and they're also a public forum for criticism and comment. And the press is our opportunity to, to have our voice be heard directly and for us to, to express ourselves through that and to provide that criticism and comment to the government, another avenue for that. There are some issues in, in political journalism as well, though. I don't want to make it out to seem they're all, you know, they're all the good guys or that, that all of political journalism is, is, uh, is to be revered and things like that. There are some issues some concerns with political journalism that we need to be aware of. The first is this agenda setting function. There's a very popular, um, uh, saying in, in communication theory related to the media that the, the, uh, the, uh, Media does not tell us what to think, but they tell us what to think about. Okay, so it's not so much that the media is feeding us all this information, you know, just you know, warping our minds and things like that. They, they're not necessarily telling us what to think, but in many ways they do tell us what to think about because they're the ones who decide what gets in front of us. They set that agenda. What's going to be important for us today? What are we going to consume today? Well, they set that agenda and they decide you know, what stories get in, what stories get out. And that's a very powerful function. Uh, and so some media outlets and, and some media handle that more responsibly than others. But it is a very important function and something we as a, as a public need to keep a check on, uh, on that agenda setting function and make sure that we're getting what we need from the media, not just what they want us to have or, or decide we should have. There's also, over the years, media has become very segmented, uh, and the, the segmentation takes the form of uh, a variety of things. Um, first, segmented in terms of the types of media. Um, people become either, you know, a newspaper person or a TV person, or, a, you know, a, a social media person where you get all your information, or a, or a magazine person, or whatever, you know, we, we divide the audience between the different types of media. But then even within that, now we've started to see very much a segmentation where different media outlets are specifically reaching out to a specific audience, you know, and the most, um, uh, the most evident version of this is, for example, Fox News, uh, clearly in the, in the um, you know, prominence of, of President Trump has been appealing to that type of, you know, the conservative, uh, deeply Republican kind of uh, audience. And, and some other outlets have gone the opposite direction, right? Have, have started to appeal to, you know, other, uh, the non-Republican audience and, and started to segment because of that. So now we're dividing, you know, becoming more segmented in terms of the, the, uh, the way that information is presented and things like that. So we're seeing the segmentation of media in a variety of different ways. And that's, that's an issue because uh, then people aren't getting the full picture necessarily. We're also seeing much more adversarial journalism. And again, this has always been a thing. I don't want to make it seem like this is something new. This is adversarial journalism, or sometimes we call it gotcha journalism, where all they're looking for is that opportunity to make somebody look bad. And this happens on both sides, you know, both, both political sides of the political conversation at the moment. And, uh, but it, this has become much more prominent now with this, with this segmentation, um, for people to kind of try and lay a trap or, or, or use uh, phrases or words against somebody from the other side, the quote-unquote other side of things, right? So this adversarial journalism has become much more prominent, and uh, and so that's that's an issue as well, because it's taken away from the sort of uh, unbiased, the, what we hope would be a sort of unbiased um, view of the media, uh, and that the media would take, so that's become an issue. So one of the things that's become very prominent, though, in our current society is this idea of fake news. We hear this all the time. We hear this expression, fake news, out there, fake news, this is fake news. And we hear it uh, about all kinds of different articles. So let's just provide some definition of fake news as we get into here how the press is covering politics and, and how, pol how politicians uh, uh, relate to the press. So let's define fake news and what it actually is. So first of all, you have this idea of false news. False news is stuff that's just made up. It's simply not true, and it's intentionally not true. And sometimes it's even made up to look like real news. This looks like a real news site. It's designed almost like the CNN.com uh, website, right? But this is a, a fake news, not fake news, sorry. This is a false news site. This is all just information that's just not, simply not true. And, and they know that. I mean, this is, this is stuff that's simply not, uh, not true. Um, so that's false news. And we need to label it as such, false news, when it's simply and intentionally not true. There's also times when you have mistaken news, though, when the news gets it wrong. Famously, in the, in the presidential election here, where President, Trui, er, sorry, President Truman defeated 
uh, Dewey, but nobody expected him to, right? Uh, you could almost do the same thing with in 2016. There may have been articles printed up that said you know, Clinton defeats Trump, and we know that didn't happen, right? I mean, it just didn't happen that way, and it was a surprise. But And so sometimes the news gets it wrong, and they make a mistake, in which case they typically will say, Sorry, I, uh, we made a mistake, and let's print a retraction and so forth. So there's mistaken news as well. It's not intentional. It's not intended to be uh, false or misleading, but but they get it wrong sometimes. So you have false news, which is intentionally wrong. You have mistaken news, which is just incorrect, and so you'll issue a, an apology and a retraction and, and try and get it right. And then you have what we now define as fake news. And fake news is a label that, that politicians and other prominent people put on a story, a specific story, that they don't like, that they don't like it. It reflects poorly on them. They don't, they don't want it to be uh, believed, and so they just call it fake news because it's convenient. But but fake news is not wrong news necessarily, right? So you may have, you know, one prominent example recently here was, you know, when the New York Times uh, published a story revealing President Trump's uh, former tax payments and losses and so forth and, and small payments of taxes and things, and uh, and so that was do, you know decried as as fake news by the Trump administration and, and President Trump himself. It's all fake news. It's fake news. But that doesn't mean it's false, right? Fake news is not necessarily false news. It's just news that's inconvenient for the person in question. Uh, and, you know, not coincidentally, at the same time, when we're talking about segmentation of media and, uh, and uh, you know, things like that, at the same time that this very article was being was being touted by every news media outlet uh, in the United States, really, this was the headline on Fox News. Or this is the Fox News website at that exact same time. No mention of that, just just as an illustration of the, the segmentation and the preferences of different media outlets now. So that won't surprise anybody if who's paying attention, though. Uh, so why do we believe fake news? Well, just very quickly, we believe fake news because there is a declining trust in the media for, for a lot of different reasons. But there, over the past few decades, there's been a very much a steep decline in trust for the media. So people just don't trust the media as much anymore. There's also been, and part of the issue there has been this blurring of journalism and opinion. Uh, we have uh, situations where people like Fox News, for example, and, and I'll use another illustration too, um, but Fox News is a very prominent one where you have opinion people and you have real journalists. Brett Meyer, uh, Chris Wallace, these are solid journalists. They're out, they're news people. They're out there to get the news and they have been for years. That's been their profession. They are journalists. But you, then you have people like Tucker Carlson and, uh, and, and folks along that line on Fox News that are more opinion people. And you do have the same thing in like CNN, for example. You have Wolf Blitzer and Anderson Cooper, who are more traditional, tried and true news people, right? as opposed to someone like Chris Cuomo or Don Lemon. They are more opinion people, and they're not, you know, they may be journalists, but they're not necessarily, that's not their role on that network. So, so you have that blurring, though, and people have the trouble telling the difference because they're, they're presented in much the same way. We also just lack media literacy in our culture. So that's that's one big thing. We need more lit media literacy. Uh, there's been a shift in the consumption methods, again, from you know, the, the one hour of national news in the evening to now you have a constant Twitter feed with all kinds of quote-unquote citizen journalists. Uh, and then just the, the, the repetition. We hear it so often that we, when you hear something a hundred times a day, it starts to become like, oh, yeah, I guess that is true. So what can we do to combat fake news? Then we can follow ethical guidelines as journalists. We can follow we can follow ethical guidelines and have journalists follow those guidelines. We can differentiate and label between advocacy and commentary, right? So again, Chris Wallace, that's news journalism. Tucker Carlson, he just views whatever he wants, and that's fine. But that's opinion. We need to label the difference. We need to support media literacy. Again, we, a lack of media literacy is part of the problem, and so we need to support media literacy. Another issue, uh, in addition to fake news, just real quickly, is this post-truth, this idea of uh, there are alternative facts, so to speak. Um, so uh, post-truth is relating to or denoting to circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals. So, for example, we have this, you know, at the, not to pick on President Trump constantly, but he kind of asked for it. Uh, at his inauguration, his uh, his press secretary said it was a record number of people at this inauguration. When, when we look at the photos, there's a lot of people there, but compare that to Obama's first in inauguration, we can see that there are not as many people. So, But uh, Kelly Ann Conway, his communication director, just called this alternative facts. So uh, what's this to us? We need to understand not all politicians are the same, not all media outlets are the same, and media criticism is our responsibility. 